All right, guys, welcome into the program. What are we talking about today? Can democracy be exported from Western countries to non-Western countries where democracy does not have a tradition of being the government system of choice? Now, what I'm going to argue is the United States and the West in general will always face a very, very difficult challenge when trying to democratize otherwise non-democratic societies. And so the case in point of this is the last, I don't know, 15, 17 years of American foreign policy trying to go about putting in a full-fledged democracy in Iraq and Afghanistan, which has pretty much been a complete failure. Now, the reasons it has been a complete failure are vast and numerous, but some of the ones that I want to focus on are in Iraq, in Afghanistan, there is no long cultural history of democracy. And let's take a step back. Democracy actually started in Greece, not with Plato. Plato did not like democracy, but it nonetheless it started in Greece. But think about the kind of democracies, the freedom of speech led democracies of today really sprang out of the enlightenment of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries in Europe, in Italy, in France, in Germany, in particularly the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom really led the way in democratic thinking. This history of democratization came from a few different angles. The first angle was this ideological angle of different philosophers like John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Baron de Montesquieu talking about, theorizing about what a democratic society could look like, separation of powers, fundamental rights of life and property, these types of things. So you had this ideological tradition of different scholars in an open society, relatively, hashing it out, arguing it out, getting their ideas out in public. Alongside this ideological tradition, you also had another tradition of this gradual separation of church and state. Now, this is very, very important for democracies. If you want to have a full-fledged democratic society, you have to have this separation of power, particularly political power, between the dominant religion of the day and the rest of the populace. Because if you don't have this decoupling of the dominant religious tradition, then anyone who is not a part of the dominant religious tradition feels very alienated, feels very isolated, vulnerable, and cut off from the rest of the political society. Plus, the history in Europe and around the world of the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion noticeably isn't very good when there's a very sort of tyrannical religious power overseeing the political structure of a different state. And so the decoupling, the separation of church and state in a political sense is very, very important for democracies, liberal democracies to flourish. The last ingredient for, I think, European democracy was a very painful period of religious and civil wars. So if you look at the continent of Europe, the continent of Europe in the 17th century was embroiled in one of the worst wars of all of human history where different religious sects, Protestants, Catholics, were battling harsh, horrific, millions of people dying type battles and warfares and genocides and ethnic cleansing all through the continent because you didn't have this decoupling of church and state. Because of that, because of various civil wars, because of the French Revolution, Democracy has a very violent, a very violent, very bloody history in Europe. But it finally got to this point of people saying, hey, we can't have, we cannot have these types of wars of religion, these types of wars of aggression premeditated on almost tribal convictions of I'm Catholic or I'm Calvinist. We have to decouple that. We have to separate it to some extent. Let people who are not a part of the dominant religion enjoy rights, freedom, eventually freedom of speech, freedom of expression, even freedom of exercising their religious rights. So if you take that as a backdrop, let's fast forward to today into, let's say, the United States effort to introduce democracy into a place like Iraq, for example. One of the biggest problems that Iraq had is that it was very, very divided along sectarian and even religious lines. So on the religious side, you had the Sunni and the Shia, the two dominant Muslim traditions. On the ethnic side, you had the Kurds in the north. Now, while the U.S. forces were in Iraq after the surge, where they had established a secure environment to let democracy finally take root and there wasn't a civil war and sectarian violence, 
the U.S. presence was there, and it basically provided assurance to the different factions, particularly the minority factions of the Sunni and the Kurds in the north, that the Shia majority wouldn't just take over and obliterate the rights of all the other different communities. And so while the United States Army was there, democracy could take root because the Sunnis knew that the Americans would not let the Shia overtake them be prejudiced towards them, institute harsh rules, oppressive measures towards the minority groups. Once the United States left, there was not this democratic tradition of let's protect the minority, let's enshrine minority rights and religious rights. Oh, no, no, no. The Shia under Nouri al-Maliki went on a tremendously oppressive campaign against the Sunni. Now, you can throw in the religious element here, that there is a difference between Sunnis and Shia and the religious elements, and because this decoupling of church and state across the Middle East hasn't had a very good track record, I'm looking at you, Iran, looking at you, Saudi Arabia, Shia in one instance, Sunni in another, very, 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 very coupled regimes of religion on the one hand and political power on the other hand. I mean, the supreme leader of Iran is the religious leader. There isn't much of a tradition here yet of this decoupling of church and state in the Middle East. There isn't much of a tradition yet of the protection of minority rights. In fact, the only place you really see a strong, a very strong protection of religious and other minority rights is actually within Israel. Ooh. The point is, it's very difficult for democracy to come into a place, now let's say Syria, which has been completely obliterated and established on very harsh sectarian lines. Very hard for democracy to come in. On the flip side, you could make the argument, one could make the argument, that what is happening in the Middle East right now is what was happening in Europe during the 17th century wars of religion, right? The Middle East is going through this time period of incredibly violent, incredibly sectarian warfare and killing based on religious and sectarian lines. And eventually, hopefully, they will come to realize, just like the Europeans did, that this is a completely asinine, ridiculous, destructive, non-helpful ideology to have in place. And so maybe what's happening is the Middle East is having to go through this process of utter chaos and violence along mainly sectarian lines so that eventually they come out on the other side and they say, hey, you know what? Maybe as a society, it is actually better if we just protect minorities, protect religious rights, so we don't open ourselves up to this kind of unending sectarian tension. Many people would look at that argument and laugh and say, man, this has just been the Middle East for thousands of thousands of years. Nothing's going to change. It's pure realist power plays on the sides of different regimes and different factions, op opposition factions within the different countries. And I would say, you know what? You're probably right. You're probably right. I, don't, I can't say for sure that this is a 30-year religious war type moment where at the end of it, the Middle East is suddenly going to see the light and not battle everyone on sectarian lines and kill people because of their religion or their tribal affiliation. I hope that that's the case. I really hope that that's the case, but it might not be the case. And in the meantime, for a Western outside imperial power to then come in and introduce democracy, particularly democracy as worked in their Western context, but not necessarily in a more Eastern context, very, very difficult, ladies and gentlemen. Very, very difficult. And so the question then to end is, can democracy be exported into these different types of cultural environments? Now, let me say as well to end that I don't, I'm not trying to say that the Western context is somehow innately better than the traditional Eastern context. What I am saying is, if you prefer to live in a democracy, you probably want to make your way West. If you prefer a more tribal, more group identity, then you probably want to make your way East. Over to you. I'm not saying which one is better. I leave that up to you, the viewer. All right, guys, what do you think about all this? Do you think democracy is actually exportable? You can point to different times in history where the United States and the West has been very good at exporting democracy. I'm looking at you, South Korea. I'm looking at you, Japan. I'm looking at you, Taiwan. Although originally when Taiwan and South Korea became democratic, they were very, very, very authoritarian and only recently have become democratic. But nonetheless, they have. They have made the transition. But is their context different from the Middle East and South Asia? Maybe it is. I don't know. Start the discussion below, let me know, share the video, subscribe to the channel, and remember, reality always trumps ideology. Mm -hmm.